This is the World Organic News for the week ending 1st of May 2017. John Moore reporting. I'd like to start this week with a big thank you to DS Early Bird 12's comment on Podbean. Interesting and pertinent. Thank you so much. Now to the blog Organic Matters by Melody Mayer and a series of posts on the National Organic Standards Board. Melody spoke on behalf of United Natural Foods. She spoke about the need for market-driven solutions with the within the organic food sector. Quote, It's the dollars and cents, the economic growth that organic represents for producers, manufacturers and retailers. For consumers, it's the option to have an informed choice through the USDA label. Expanding and preserving that choice helps consumers avoid persistent pesticide exposure. It helps correct the environmental degradation of non-organic production methods. End quote. I found this thought-provoking. The market, in inverted commas, is a social construct. Defined by the governments of the world, the rules for markets are decided, not so much by Adam Smith's unseen hand, but by that unseen hand operating within the rules, decided in unseen smoke-filled back rooms. So with a little tweaking and a whole lot of subsidy redistribution, the market could be made to work for rather than just against the organic movement. The way the system is set up now... Farmers who do not use poisons have to spend thousands to prove this is the case. Those farmers who regularly douse their crops in poisons, pesticides, herbicides and artificial fertilisers are free to sell whatever they want, based on the 50% death rules. 50% death rules, I hear you ask? Yes. A poison is determined safe for human consumption on the following basic idea. Lab rats are fed a poison. The length of time it takes to kill half of them is the key to human food safety. Once the 50% death rate is reached, a conclusion is reached as well, and the remaining 50% of surviving rats are euthanised. There are therefore no data on long-term effects of these poisons, only their immediate acute effects. Sounds like a system designed for chemical manufacturers rather than human food consumers. Changing the rules of the market, changing these rules of the market would immediately increase the safety of foods and give the organic sector a huge boost. I would suggest as individuals the way to overcome this bias and the many others embedded in the non-judgmental values free in inverted commas market, which determines the best price for both consumers and suppliers, is to avoid anything, and I mean anything, that does not have a certified organic label. Now, there may be perfectly safe insecticides out there, but we have no way of knowing given the testing regime currently in place. And who knows how safe the cockroach and spider sprays are that are used on homes, or used on all buildings, really. We are, after all, inhabiting these structures, not ingesting them until half of us drop dead. Now, to the other end of the food system, the soil. This from an interview with Robin Bate, a former federal chief scientist in Australia. Robin was a guest on the long-running Radio National program, The Science Show. The title for this interview gives us a clue. Soil carbon, a saviour in locking up carbon. Now, the science around soil carbon is messy. The soil is, after all, a living thing. Quote, It is not fully understood, far from it. Although with genetic typing these days, we can understand much more of the thousands of interactions that go on. That's one whole side, which is how do we encourage more of the bacteria and the fungi so that you get actually more carbon in the soil. You get greater root penetration. You get greater water retention and so on, end quote. Robin's argument is that we have sufficient knowledge, if not the ability to accurately measure soil carbon, to start the process of moving agriculture from artificial fertilisers and poisons to regenerative agriculture. Noting the following ways soil carbon is lost. Quote, we lose it essentially by two methods. One, we clear native vegetation and turn it into intensive agriculture. That almost inevitably results in the loss of carbon from the soil. That's one. The other is by extensive use of tilling, which changes the oxidative state of the soil, changes the balance between fungi, which tends not to want to be too oxidative, and bacteria, by use of pesticides, which similarly affect the biota by use of extensive fertiliser application in a form which is not readily absorbed by plants. We just slowly, surely grind the carbon down, end quote. 
Robin gives rough measurements on the amount of soil carbon lost here in Australia. Seems that we moved from a soil carbon content of 3-4% to 4% in the time of Strezlecki, a Polish nobleman, explorer and scientist who came to the colony of New South Wales in 1839, to a level, level closer today of 1%. Reversing this loss would pull more carbon out of the atmosphere than has been dumped into it by industry. Not a reason to stop the move to renewables, but, on soil fertility grounds alone, reason to move to regenerative agriculture. And that brings us to the end of this week's podcast. If you like what you've heard, please tell everyone you know any way you can. I'd also really appreciate a review on iTunes or the podcatcher of your choice. This may or may not help others to find us, but it gives me an enormous thrill. Thanks in advance. Any suggestions, feedback or criticisms of the podcast or blog are most welcome. Email me at podcast at worldorganicnews.com. That's it, and I'll be back in a week. Thanks for listening.